Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 79 of Ask the CEO with Avraham Gatile. Today, I'd like to introduce a very special guest. She's the CEO of IoTDisruptions.com and a globally recognized technology futurist with 20 plus year mix of entrepreneurial, academic, and operational experience from eBay, PayPal, GTE, and Hardcourt. She's the author of 2030 The Driverless World, Business Transformation from Autonomous Vehicles, and three IoT books, Teacher of IoT and Autonomous Vehicles Business Courses at Stanford Continuing Studies and at driverlessworldschool.com. She enjoys shaping new technology ecosystems and mentoring leaders on digital transformation. She chairs the Strategic Advisory Council of Barcelona Technology School and an ambassador for Funding Box Impact Connected Cars Community. She has an MBA from Boston University. It is my pleasure to welcome the one and only Suda Jamti. Welcome, Suda. Thank you, Abraham. I'm happy to be back. Yes. Welcome back. This is your second appearance here. So glad to have you. Thank you. So Suda, I'm really excited to be talking to you today about your new course at Stanford University, Cognitive IoT, how to build a successful business with the internet of things. So what on earth is Cognitive IoT? <laughs> my, my course is called How to Build a Successful Business with Internet of Things. And I brought that as the very first course about IoT business in Stanford about three years back. And at that time, IoT was about devices, wearables. And slowly people figured out that you take IoT data and you, it's so massive in volume that you have to apply artificial intelligence. And so the combination of AI and IoT is cognitive IoT. So I don't call the course as cognitive IoT, but it is about combination of AI with IoT data. Yeah, and you know, it's so true what you say about needing AI to sift through the mounds and mounds of data because with all the new sensors that are being added on a daily basis, and I believe there's going to be something like 100 billion devices in the next two years, humans are physically just not going to be able to go through all that data. That is true. And it it spreads a whole realm of areas, right? When, When people think about IoT, they think about devices or based on where they are, if they are in a factory or they are in a city setting or, you know, just fitness buffs, wearing, you know, wearables. They think about IoT in different areas with a device. But all these devices are all about connecting anything to the internet and tracking temperatures or moods or uh, um, all kinds of uh, things that's happening in the environment. So I have a security camera outside my home. And initially, it was just a security camera, right? So it just keeps track of whatever anybody is doing and it's a video stream and true story we actually had a uh, something at our door uh, stop uh, you know it's like a piece of thing that you know like a fish that a cat must have dropped and we actually sifted through this security camera footing three years back and it was a nightmare it was a joke, right? I mean, looking at this as when the cat came and we said, oh, you see, it was still here. It was still at this time and it was a nightmare. But today we have, you know, over the period of time, we've, we've adopted to Nest Cam and Nest has this Nest IQ where it tells me whether a person showed up. Now it tells me whether the person is a known person who showed up. And so now I know when my mailman comes or, you know, somebody is dropping a flyer or there's a stranger at the door. And so... All that is IoT data and it is processed by AI. And I think people who are not working with AI directly have a hard time even thinking of a security device as an IoT or what does AI mean? AI seems like this abstract. It's so true that uh, the applications have changed over the years. And when I talk about IoT, I define it as the ecosystem in which we communicate with our connected devices over the internet. So when you talk about the cognitive IoT, that makes a lot of sense. It puts some thinking into it. Well, let's see. So this cat burglar, when did it come in? Was it, was it, well, was it your cat or was it someone else's cat? (laughs) That's right. That's right. And there could be practical applications like, uh, you know, today, 
uh, Nest IQ is telling me who's coming in front of my house. It's doing that across multiple houses and there are security cameras and there are connected doorbells which are tracking people uh, everywhere. So zoom out at a larger scale for a city. Now, if there is somebody who's a bad guy who's on the run and the cops want to find them, right? Now they can actually access the security footage and actually find out, okay, this person was on a third avenue. And now I see them next, they're spotted at, you know, seventh avenue. So they're heading in this direction. Otherwise, the old fashioned way is for people to give call in with tips and say, I think I saw the person and it might not be the same person. So now they can actually dynamically track that. So this could be, you know, finding uh, bad people or it could be uh, uh, connecting people who are lost in a fair. There are like endless applications. And it could even become like an ID for us. More and more facial recognition is becoming like your ID, right? I use that on my, on my iPhone X and it opens, right? Now you can check in and keep moving through, you know, uh, getting into a bank or airport and so many places. And so it, it changes our way of living and we don't stop and think, oh, it's scanning my face. It's processing that data. And we don't think of data as images and stuff, but it's going to get us to this connected world, which is faster. And we stop doing mundane things like removing our shoes and standing in security lines and you know, be, go sh showing a piece of paper, which is the passport to a human being who looks at it and looks at your face and you cringe and think, oh my God, that picture is not good from five years back, <laughs> right? And so now you just go through things so you can focus on the things that you want to focus into the future. So next time I need to get my driver's license renewed, does that mean I get to skip the line at the DMV? <laughs> it's possible we could get there because <laughs> if they're actually ta if they're actually looking at our, our fingerprint and our iris and you know just identifying us, they don't need the picture the way it is sitting you know today, you know. Now, I know, for example, in the medical field, there are many applications where this would be a good fit. Uh, are there any of them that come to mind? Medicine with digital health is a huge area. So the easiest thing is to think of our, our uh, wearables, right? The, the fitness bands that we wear and track how many steps we walk, right? But take that a step further. It's not just tracking how many steps you walk, it's tracking all your biometrics. And the fitness band doesn't have to be something that you wear, it could be part of your clothing, it could be part of your shoes, it could be the, you know, the diabetes uh, tracker eyeglass that, you know, it's a lens that yeah, you wear and it just tracks whether you have diabetes. So it could check your biometrics. And now when you take that data, it's not a device gets data and it talks to the user. It's going to be like the device and sensors are just there in our lives collecting data about our state of being. And then it makes sure that it proactively that we stay healthy. So in future, when you have enough of these cognitive, not even cognitive, general sensors all over your body or your wrist or your, there are pills that is what tracking you on the inside, then proactively, uh, there could be like, you know, predictive analytics run on this data to say, hey, you have a, a kidney problem. Maybe it's going to show up in five years. And I want you to come in for a checkup. And proactively, we are going to make sure that you do not get to that place. Or it could be that I, I have a certain gene which has a certain risk for some disease. And then I could be checked with a, uh, one of these sensors, which is just tracking my heart uh, rhythm, whether it is right. And then I could proactively be, you know, my, my doctor might be monitoring it proactively and, and get guidance from an AI, which, which says what they need to be giving me or advising me. So it could be like, especially health, medical. Like for cancer, for example, imagine catching it 10 years earlier than we're capable of doing that today. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially for cancer research, I think pretty much every, every uh, hospital involved and research body involved is working on it. Uh, IBM Watson has actually sifted through cancer research uh, data from all our past and makes a live comparison of you know, the cells when they, when, the, when they get the results of some uh, 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 
uh, cell uh, to mm -hmm. see whether they, somebody has cancer. Uh, the doctor has to manually look at it. Instead, the, you know, IBM Watson actually scours through it and makes a high confidence prediction whether it is a certain type of cancer. And even within, if you take a, a specific type of cancer on, you know, the, the liver like uh, uh, Steve Jobs had, there are so many categories of it and there must be a rare type and they could actually catch that. But uh, uh, AI would come with that with a very high degree of, of uh, accuracy. And like you said, if they found that so much sooner, even before the person had the symptoms and had to start complaining, they could get care. You know, that's the the holy grail of, of digital health yeah. and medicine, yeah. Now, an interesting use case we were chatting about over Twitter was uh, regarding somebody on a treadmill. Do you want to share that <laughs> with the audience? I was very inspired by David Holding's uh, uh, interview with you, and it just got my mind raising, you know? I like to think about futuristic scenarios, not just like here and now put this and go build this stuff, right? That's what I help my students go build the future. And so uh, when I heard uh, David talk about so much data in, you know, from sensors and how to use the, the cloud for it and, you know, in that context, I was just thinking um, it is not just, if you think of IoT as a device and the same fitness variable example, you track steps and you say, oh, I'm helping people uh, by motivating them to exercise to stay healthy. If I wear the business person's uh, hat, it is a nice to have, right? I'm not walking 10,000 steps and you know, you, you help me share that with my friends and motivate me to do that, right? And yes, I will be healthy if I did that, but people will not change as easily. And I'm still lazy. I don't do my 10,000 steps. Whereas if you take that data of my health and you take my general patient record, you take this in the context of, hey, I want to save lives. And how do I do that as a business and, and save lives? And where is it going to be applicable when uh, somebody is running on a treadmill? Their heart is going to be racing and they should not be crossing a certain threshold. It's, it's logical. And you know how they do that today? If they take you to go, run on a treadmill for medical reasons, they will watch for the th threshold and get you down. A human being gets you down in a very manual way, right? But if I'm exercising, you know, you know, uh, in the gym, gym yeah. thank you. And uh, if my, if my uh, heart rate goes up a certain rate, the default today is, oh, what is your height? What is your body ma mass uh, index? And so this is what it should be, right? You should be running at, the, your heart should be, uh, your pulse should be at this rate. But if I have a certain history and I have a certain gene, my, I should be customized personally. I, I should have a certain threshold. And so that is not humanly possible today. But if this data from the fitness band, seeing the trend and my medical records, a bunch of data streams are put together, there could be an AI in the cloud watching me when I go jogging, when I'm standing running in a treadmill in a gym, which means it's an application for a gym, not for a hospital, it could be that I'm jogging and out in the field, and then I could have a fitness device that is actually warning me to not start uh, across a certain threshold. There's a company called Sensoria, uh, which makes uh, wearables, which are you know clothing and stuff with uh, uh, for uh, tracking IoT. And one of them is they make a, a shoe which tracks your gait. On so that you, you run right and it doesn't give you, you know, back problems. Now what they've done is they said, hey, let's put this in the shoes when somebody is driving a race car. And when they're driving a race car, they are going to, it's, it's the thrill, but the thrill means your heart is pumping. And if I have a certain health condition that I, my heart should not cross, uh, you know, heart rate should not cross a certain threshold, who's tracking that when I'm driving a race car? I don't, but Theoretically, if you assume I'm the one driving the race car, I could be wearing the Sensoria shoes on a Lamborghini and it could actually tell me to pull over <laughs> or slow down <laughs> because it's going to kill me. <laughs> I mean, that's what I was saying. It could be on a treadmill, it could be on a speeding car, it could be, you know, when I'm jogging, it could be my life at any time. And so then the application, if you zoom out, because I focus on the business of this and help people build the right business. If I'm running a gym, if I have this race car 
I actually a race car person, you know, not a race car person. It's like a funny word, like race car company. Driving on the Autobahn or some New York City highways. <laughs> no, I meant to say a real car company, right? A car, car uh, OEM who makes race cars, right? Now they could actually say, hey, I want to take responsibility for the health of my racer and I'm going to give them these shoes or I'm going to bake this into the, the steering pedal when they are, when they're racing so that it tracks their health and, and guides them right. And the car would not speed a past a certain speed if that's not personally healthy for me. Think of a I'm, car like that. I, I like that where there's, there's this automation in there besides the warning, which again, depends on a manual process because you depend on the human's intelligence to actually yeah. stop what they're doing. Yeah. And it controls the vehicle or even slows the treadmill down. That's right. That's right. And I might not listen in the high of my race and wanting to win my race. I will be like, yeah, just one be, more, be quiet. One more bend, I could just win this race and I'm not going to listen to the flashing warning. Right. <laughs> and again, it comes back to, you know, a lot of sensors tracking things, but it goes back to the AI in the cloud. And it's not just one set of data stream. Again, people miss out on understanding that all these data are like have friends of other data feeds and it becomes, that's where it becomes more massive. And then, then it's like a joy for the AI to, you know, feast on this and come up with recommendations. And that's, that's another cognitive IoT application. This is really fascinating, Suda. And boy, I would love to be in that class of yours. So <laughs> tell, me, tell me about it. So what kind of topics do you discuss in this class? So um, I started out, like I said, how to build a successful business with IoT. So I keep the focus on uh, introducing my students. Uh, my students are professionals, people like you, but the class happens to be on campus in Stanford. So you need to be here, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately. So I start out giving them a landscape of what is IoT? What does the ecosystem look like? I can theoretically say whatever, but you need to know who are the players, who's doing what, and how it all adds up in a, in a, as a whole ecosystem. And we start off with that in the first couple of weeks. And then I introduce them to a variety of applications in covering every possible industry. There is no industry that is not impacted, not just touched, but impacted and being disrupted by IoT. So then I kind of give them the, the gamut. That's the first couple of weeks. And then I introduce them to like regulation. What does that, I don't, it is not a course for building technology but you need to understand the, the, the complexity of customer experience. And there is this clunky hardware, there is a piece of software, there is things in the cloud, there's the way you connect all this into a platform. So I kind of give that uh, possibilities and what's out there today, you know. I tried to stay very neutral and not just biased to a brand, but I have my favorites. And so <laughs> we do that in the first few weeks. And then based on what background my students come from, what is their goal in the class? So I, I typically have like product managers, uh, marketing managers, a lot of entrepreneurs, and a lot of people who are innovative thinkers doing different business roles, but they are like change agents inside their companies. They like to bring the latest in tech to kind of go do something in a very interesting way. A lot of people are doing career pivots to get into this whole world of AI, uh, using IoT as a stepping stone. Some people are interested in, in autonomous vehicle because that's my other topic that I research. I bring that as connected cars to this class. So the first two weeks is the ecosystem regulation, what technology, what does the lay of the land look like? What are the possibilities in terms of application? Then we kind of shift gears and go into what does, uh, how do you build this thing with the customer as focus, like the treadmill example I gave. How, what are the different use cases for building out a new business in IoT? What's not taken? I'm always looking for gaps to innovate. And, for, and then what about existing businesses? And then I pick certain industries. I pick three industries based on who's in the class. So if I have people who come from medical background, then I might go deeper into that. If I have people who are investment bankers trying to invest in the space, then I kind of go into that angle. If I might have people who are like in, in interested in smart cities or were interested in transportation, then I kind of go. Uh, that's how I do that in the, the next phase. And then the bulk of the class, I go into this whole value creation from data because that's my sweet spot. And what 
is IoT data? What are the different, the same data can be used in various different ways in various different industries. So kind of introduced to the variety of IoT data, the, the various business use cases around that. And then we get into the nitty gritties of, okay, now you're a business person. You are building an IoT or your company is building an IoT in some form. Now, how do you make this into a viable, scalable business, which means it makes money it solves a fundamental problem for somebody, which is not just a nice to have. And then you have to go build channels and scale. And how do you do that? What are the practical implications to get there? What is, what is more strategic and what will work here? What will not work in, for an IoT industry? And I give the theory and I have lectures each week. The format is I'll have lectures. And then I bring an external speaker so that they know for real, how do they do this? So I have the speaker from a variety of industries. Now, I, the, the things you were discussing is something that many businesses struggle with. How do you actually make money with it? Because it used to be with IoT, oh, we've got an IoT company. Let's, let's create a product and then shoehorn an industry out of it or a use case out of it. So yep. uh, I'm really happy to hear that you cover that because I think that's really uh, very important to cover that. So one, one thing I want to say in terms of existing industries, like I made this bold statement that every industry is being disrupted by IoT. So uh, we spoke about medicals. I don't want to give just medical examples, but uh, our, fit, our uh, uh, health, mo um, my BP monitor and everything, right? These days are all IoT connected, pacemakers, all of them, right? And it's not just medical devices. That's what you hear a lot about. Every single appliance or everything that's being manufactured, be it a car, it could be the uh, light, it could be my toaster. And people talk about toaster becoming intelligent. I wish it does and serves me breakfast, but that's not. There are refrigerators now that are intelligent. Yeah. They, they check to see how much milk you have and based on the usage on yeah. how, how much you use every day, it yeah. will automatically order milk. That's right. I mean, that's, that's all like use cases which has not hit mainstream yet, right? We are early adopters, we love the space, so we might be you know, testing those out. But for the average person, every traffic light in the city is connected. And it's not, I'm not talking about US. I, I know at least 50 cities who have different stages of waste management that is IoT enabled, uh, traffic lights which manage, uh, which turn on, on and off and manage the, the tra do traffic control. There's a whole bunch of use cases in various realms. Right. So uh, based on that, there, there could be students who are interested in one area or another. Mm. Now, another thing that you mentioned was pivoting your career uh, to IoT, which is something that's very personal to me because I come from telecom and I had to do that pivot. So I understand many of the challenges that people go through when pivoting a career. So can you tell me a little bit about the types of students that you have, uh, you know, what kind of... Uh, uh, what are some of the success stories, uh, you know, that they've had taking your course? Thank you for asking that because I love to brag about my students. So one of the things I figured out when I got into this whole research mode and very fascinated by this endless possibility with IoT is it, I just don't want to give research on, hey, this is futuristic and, you know, this is happening and write articles about it. When I wrote my very first book, that was my uh, calling right i had to figure out why am i doing this who am i helping and i found that every tech i believe technology is here to change the world for good and if you look at any uh, form of technology that is being applied in any company right it's not just one group of people it's not it's not just the engineers who are building it's not just the marketing people in the periphery who are just promoting it to somebody there's a slew of job roles and they all have to get to that. So when, you know, when they were like pre-internet and everything was brick and mortar and they had to get to the internet, it's not just about creating a website and just, you know, marketing and sending people there. You need to fundamentally understand your customers and there are many different roles. So what I do in my classes, I have students who come from, I have like a couple lawyers, I have a couple investment bankers. Most of them are somewhere on the product management, product marketing, uh, regular marketing, marketing strategy, uh, uh, corporate development, various different roles, right? And they all want to figure out, okay, what does the ecosystem look like? What is the possibility? Who is doing this in my space? Who is doing something in another space that is applicable to my space to strategically take my company there? So going back to the example of the 
uh, the toaster, it, it's a, there's a regulation in California that every manufacturer of any appliance has to uh, take due, due care to make sure that devices are secure. So if I bring the toaster to my house and it is internet enabled on my fridge and it's internet enabled, now Samsung is on the line to ensure they have done everything to make sure that it is secure. How do they do that? And they have to do a bunch of blockchain to make sure that along the supply chain that the, the product is, is clean and they have control over it. And this is not just for an engineer to say, hey, now I add connectivity to the fridge and track for, for milk. It's a compliance issue. It's a legal issue. And how do you promote and market the refrigerator and make money more than what you made with an unconnected refrigerator? How do you understand the shifting customers and why, where there is value? How do you manage the cost of this and from an accounting perspective or you know, there's a compliance perspective? And there's a whole bunch of, and then how do you design this in such a way uh, from a UX human computer interface. So there are all these different roles of people who are doing that and that's the slew of my students. So I have students who typically want to pivot their career and move into IoT or do something more with IoT within their industry. So there could be somebody who works in you know car industry and I have a bunch of students there and now they want to make the car a connected car. But based on their skill set, they might be doing program management or they might be an analyst now who wants to do AI and understand you know, the business implication of doing this. Um, so there are different kinds of roles. And then I've had some people who work for you know, con big consulting companies, building solutions for you know, big factories and stuff. Um, and I have, a, I have about seven or so entrepreneurs um, who, are, who have created an IoT business and who are different step of the way in funding. So to facilitate that, what I do is, other than bringing people from the industry who will help my students, um, I guide them to build a business plan as a team, right from the, the first class. And by the last class, they would have built the business plan and I bring a team of VCs to actually review that, give them feedback, connect with them and give them money and funding and you know help them take to the next step. So there, some of them are entrepreneurs, Many of them have like, you know, pivoted in their career to do, do this, uh, take their existing business to IoT in various business roles. And uh, I, I, I stay in touch with them and I kind of cheer for them. It's kind of my calling. So once you are my student, I have like, there are LinkedIn community groups for my uh, IoT students, for my autonomous vehicle students. I just, you know, stay in touch and help them. And I want to cheer for them. They are going to be making the, the future connected driverless world. So. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's pretty amazing though, that you bring in the VCs and go through their business plans. So it's, it's more than them just coming in there and getting a brain dump of some PowerPoints and blah, 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 you know, yeah. stuff that they could read in a book. This is a real hands-on workshop where yeah. you literally hold their hand throughout the whole process. Yeah. In fact, I find that each time I've taught this class, it's different because of the group mix of students. And so I go there saying, you know, I bring this experience and knowledge, but then I'm going to facilitate a conversation. So the very first class, I just don't go and say, I'm so-and-so, this is what I'm going to teach. I actually spend time to do an introduction of everybody to say what they, they come in with. In fact, they, once anybody signs up, they're supposed to send me an email on what is their goal and what they want to take from the class. And if they'd say, oh, I want to understand the IoT ecosystem, I push them a little bit. I say, I don't want you to be a passive listener in this class. And it doesn't mean that they have to be super extroverted or, or talking, but I want them to internalize what they're learning, apply it. And I, I appreciate that they cannot build this alone, especially in IoT, there's a whole stack that you need to get to a solution and you need partnerships. And so they, and there are different job roles. So m many students usually end up, you know, partnering with other people, from where they can job, you know, move their jobs into a different role or a different company. Sometimes they get referrals from the VCs. I mean, it's all very dynamic and it's beautiful. Yeah, I imagine it is. So Suda, would you be able to share some of the information about the guest speakers you have? Yes, I will. Um, I'm gonna tell this on top of my head for who I'm remembering this time. Um, I have, let me think. Um, I have Christian Mastrodonato, who's actually coming, who's the CTO of uh, Konica Minolta. 
who focuses on enterprise IoT and AI. Uh, he's visiting here, so he's going to be my very first speaker. I managed to, to get him. There are two repeat uh, speakers. Um, you know, everybody knows about this connected doorbell and Ring has been very famous in the news because of the billion dollar acquisition. There is another company called Skybell and they have the same technology, same product, started around the same time, raised less money and uh, they decided to go a B2B route. So you don't hear their brand as Skybell, but there's their their uh, doorbells, connected doorbells are everywhere globally. And uh, that CEO, Andrew Thomas, is unbelievably amazing. He's coming back by popular demand because he can tell you what did it take to build it from an entrepreneurial standpoint? What did it take to make a B2B business to be successful in terms of partnerships? What did it take to build a team and be entrepreneurial and scale in a changing climate? And, and the whole bill of material and pricing and cost and how he's actually building a and scaling a successful business. So it's, it's unbelievable. Like, you know, listening to Andrew at the end of the class, it's like a very existential crisis for us. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> you know, what do we want to do with our life? If he's like, you know, so purposeful in what he's doing. Um, uh, John Mattison is a, a chief medical information officer of Kaiser Permanente. He's like God in this space, like in the whole, AI, healthcare, digital uh, uh, health space. Um, he's been a speaker in my class before and he's agreed to come back. So he's one of my most recent uh, speakers. And he will tell you how they use data, what they've done, the whole whole gamut in terms of uh, a heart, heart hospital setting. And then there would be lessons, not just for the healthcare person, right? There could be somebody who's in a different industry or somebody from SAP or Oracle because I have students from them, from there, uh, who is supporting a client in a very different industry, but has parallels to how, you know, it's, a, it's it, maybe they're supporting manufacturing, which is similar to healthcare in terms of the, the players and dynamics and resistance to change and, and all that stuff. Um, I have a new speaker called Mrinal Wadwa, who is, uh, who is uh, running a startup. He's a co-founder of a startup called uh, Oxcam.io. And he focuses on blockchain for cybersecurity. So the example I said about the, the appliances, like when Samsung builds a fridge, then they need to know every step of the supply chain that it was not tampered with when you get a over the air update that it is their update and not a malicious piece of code that's going to use your fridge to go hack something. Um, he pro provides a critical piece of uh, layer of tech in there. So we're gonna have you know a blockchain introduction from the context of IoT in there. Oh, and then I forgot since I focus on you know the autonomous vehicle and connected car space, of course I will have a module on that and I have a speaker from there. Um, is going to be talking about what does it take to digitize a car? When we say take a technology and build it into a business, what does it mean from the context of a car business throughout the car ecosystem? And how is a large OEM dealing with that? And he will bring real world experience in, in that. And then I have Roxy Stimson, who's a guru in uh, industrial IoT space. She's done, uh, IoT. she's the CTO of uh, IoT World Labs, and she's hosted the IoT uh, show with me for IoT Day. There's not a single IoT use case that Roxy doesn't know about. So she's going to be one of my uh, class speakers too this time. So there are at least uh, 10 of them. Wow, this sounds really exciting, Suda. And it sounds like you've got a really great uh, program. Thank you, thank you. So Suda, how do people connect with you? I live on Twitter, as you know. So, Sujamte on Twitter. I respond to every, every intelligent tweets, not, you know, uh, not the trolls. But uh, if there's a conversation, I would jump in. If people mildly just follow me, I wouldn't know that. I just don't follow everybody. I don't count, you know, I don't count page views or, or um, how many people, followers and stuff like that. But I do, I do that. And then people can find me on LinkedIn. And then uh, I have a newsletter. So if you go to IoT Disruptions, if you, there's a pop-up that will force you to sign up or like close the window before you can go look at anything else. <laughs> and so uh, that's another way people stay in touch and I, uh, you know, keep them posted on interesting happenings in the industry and case studies and stuff like that. Uh, 
Great. And I'll post that to the show notes so people can click on that and get right to you. Thank you so much. Suda, do you have any parting words of wisdom that you'd like to share with the audience? Oh, God, I should have known this was coming and <laughs> had some wise words of wisdom. Um, I love, you know, I would say they should keep watching Ask the CEO because I just love the variety. I mean, there's so many IoT conversations that happens everywhere. There's so many material articles that is about IoT. But I think I like the way that you bring interesting speakers and you go in depth. You get us talking, right? I mean, whatever I prepared, I thought I would talk about today. I think you got more out of me than I thought, right? Uh, so that's, that's, I think, is a very interesting resource that I should not forget. And then I noticed recently you've been sharing this, right? Sharing, uh, making us, you know, know that we are lazy and not saying, here's the video. You're like, go to minute uh, 53.05 and then it answers this question for you. So I think we should like acknowledge, yes, we are lazy, but you know, jump and go see that. So I've been doing that and I learn something new all the time. And I don't even have to go watch the whole video. I just go back, go to that specific minute and I get like, ha. Huh. And so what I would say is if you're into this space, watch, ask the CEO and go engage with other people who are doing things. I think that that's worked for me, right? When you see that on Twitter, and it could be different mediums for different people, but have that conversation, go find out what other people are doing. And so I typically do that on, on Twitter and I just see something, I get excited. I would answer questions if I know the answer or I would ask more questions because I love asking questions. I think that would be my advice to engage, learn, and definitely don't miss out on Ask the CEO. Engagement is definitely key. I've learned so much from people that way. So that's so true. And uh, thank you so much for that plug. <laughs> <laughs> I meant it very honestly. I meant it very honestly. Yep. Suda, thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom. I really enjoyed having you on the show. Thank you so much, Adam. I, I hope to stay in touch and keep learning.